Hello, everyone. Welcome to Public Health Insights Live Q&A. We'll be answering your questions with the hopes of giving you all the information you need to choose an MPH program and increase the likelihood that you'll receive offers of admission. My name is Gordon, your host for this Q&A, along with fellow co-hosts LaShawn and Bindra joining on camera. All right. So um, if you already haven't heard about our podcast called the Public Health Insight Podcast, feel free to check it out. It's a great resource to learn about so much uh, about different public health topics, global health topics, from the sustainability, sustainable development goals to uh, the social determinants of health. And it also gives everyone a good idea of, you know, the types of career options that are out there. So in the chat right now, I'm going to drop two links, one to Spotify and one to Apple. Feel free to check out some of those resources and subscribe. And I also want to let you know to stay tuned till the very end of this event because we're planning to do a special giveaway and it may or may not have something to do with your MPH application. So if I were you, I'd stay tuned. Hint, hint. Hint, hint. So for today's live Q&A session, we're going to be trying to cover as many important topics um, as we can. So this includes what you should consider before applying to MPH programs, choosing the right MPH program for you, what to avoid on your MPH application, um, and then lastly, how to craft an effective personal statement. And I really want to emphasize that this is meant to be an interactive experience. So we really encourage all of you to type your name in the chat box, introduce yourself, um, and let us know what country you're joining in from. And as well, throughout the entire session, feel free to insert any questions that you have um, in the chat box, and we'll try to answer and get through as many questions as we can. And Bindra, speaking of introducing our audience, introducing themselves, let's take a minute and introduce ourselves. So as I said, my name is Gordon. I did my undergrad in microbiology and immunology uh, at Western University, which also has an MPH program, which I happen to also uh, attend, and I graduated in 2019 from that program, and now I'm working as a program coordinator in the chronic disease and injury prevention department at a local health unit in Ontario. So that's that's me in a nutshell. LaShawn? Yeah, I'll go ahead. So yeah, my name is LaShawn Benedict, and I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto, uh, focusing on biochemistry and biology. I then kind of went in to do my MPH program at Western University, and I graduated in 2019. And currently, I work as a community manager for a global health community of practice, which focuses on neglected tropical diseases, which are diseases that affect billions of people across the world. And lastly, my name is Bindra. I have an undergraduate degree in medical sciences from Western University. Um, and in my undergrad, I specialize in physiology. Um, and then I went on to do my MPH degree from McMaster University, where I graduated in 2019, December. So currently I work in the area of health system improvement and population health management for the provincial government. So one thing I will mention before we carry on is we want this event, like we said, to be interactive. And I think part of that interactivity is connecting with each other. So we're just going to drop our LinkedIn profiles in the chat box right now. Feel free to connect with us. And as aspiring public health professionals and global health professionals, let's connect with each other and start building our network. So this is a great opportunity to do that. And throughout the discussion, feel free to drop in your LinkedIn to connect with others. Absolutely. Thanks, LaShawn. Thanks, Bindra. So keep in mind, as we move forward with this Q&A session, we'll of course be focused on MPH programs in Canada. However, these tips that we're gonna be sharing can also be applied to MPH programs in other countries as well. And these tips that we're providing uh, also apply for people who are either just finishing their undergrad, we get a lot of questions from undergrad, we have folks who are going back to school after working for a period of time, those are some great tips that they can use as well. And they're even people making a career change from a totally different career field. So if you identify with either one of those, stick around because this is something good for you. All right, shall we move into the Q&A? Let's do it. All right, so for those joining in the audience, thank you for submitting your questions ahead of time. We were able to go through and prepare ourselves to give you the best answers possible. You're also invited to 
submit your questions in the chat box while you're watching. We'll also try to get through as many of those as possible. So don't be shy, put them in. We'll try our best to get to them. All right, so we organized the questions. Bindra gave you an overview of what we're going to be covering today. And the natural place to start is a question that comes up quite frequently. People might say, how do I know if an MPH is right for me? So that question can be interpreted in a bunch of different ways, but I'll toss it over to LaShawn to start us off. Yeah, how do you know if the MPH is right for me? Everyone has a different reason of doing an MPH and I'll list a couple of my reasons. The first reason I think was really interesting of pursuing my MPH degree was really looking at the social context of health. Coming from a biochemical background, I always thought it was all about genetics, but understanding that the social context, the social determinants of health play such a huge role in the overall health outcomes of your community and populations. So that's kind of the first reason. I wanted to, I wanted to learn about the causes of the causes. What is causing these ailments in our society? So that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is public health is so broad. There are so many subcategories within public health that you can explore. It's not something, um, it's not, it's a, it's a field that has so many different avenues that you could pursue and you could pivot throughout each and every one, especially after pursuing an MPH, which gives you a broad skill set in many cases that you can use to check out these things. So you won't get bored over the course of your career. Maybe one day I'm interested in epidemiology and the next day I'm like, nah, I'm going to do health policy. By doing an MPH, it allows you to have that flexibility and toolkit to do that. And one question, that's a great answer, LaShawn. Nothing to add to that for me. But one of the questions that sort of fits underneath that is the MPH right for me. There are folks who are perhaps already working in the field, building up experience, and they're at sort of a crossroad to decide to continue to get more work experience, advance their career, or to do so mm -hmm. through getting an education in public health. So what would you, or Bindra, you can chime in on this as well. What are your thoughts on that? For sure. I think um, it's really interesting because there's such a broad array of public health programs available. There are some that are short term, for example, eight month or 10 month programs. Others that are much longer around 16 months or two years even. And I think when you think about which program do you want to apply to for your MPH, really think about what that end goal of yours is. Um, if you're already a working health professional, then you probably already have that basic knowledge um, in terms of what public health is, what you do um, within the field itself. Um, so your goal might just be to more so advance your career and maybe specialize in something. So perhaps you want to look into a specialized program instead of a generalist program. Um, on the other hand, if maybe you're a fresh undergrad just coming out with little or little to no work experience, then perhaps you want to do more of a generalized public health program um, and perhaps do a longer one that will give you more of that knowledge that you may need um, to build up that work experience before you get out into the field. Um, so I think it's really important to look into what each program offers and like how it fits into your own career goals. Yeah, it, absolutely. And one of the things I'll add to that, Bindra, is uh, I see people in the chat talking about how they're interested in certain areas of public health or maybe come from a background in public health or healthcare. I think you could use that to your advantage, right? If you're a doctor, if you're a pharmacist, or maybe you've specialized as um, or you've done work as a pharmacy assistant, these are skills and experiences that can help build your repertoire for when you start applying to these MPH programs. And you could draw from those rich experiences. So keep that in mind, whether I see someone's interested in public oral, oral public health, um, dentistry maybe, keep that in mind. You can use some of those skills and bring that into public health. Remember, when we're talking about public health, we're talking about community level, population level, and prevention. So how can that apply to your specific area of interest? Yeah, and if you don't believe us, so your folks from, in, in our cohort, LaShawn, we went to Western MPH class of 2019. Mm -hmm. We had folks from nutrition, nursing, uh, dentistry, whether dentists or you know oral hygienists or dental hygienists, and folks from the pharmacy industry, uh, nursing, anthropology. So... What it really is, like LaShawn said, everything is linked to health, health and public health prides himself on being interdisciplinary. So if you sell the value you bring to the field based on your lived experience, that's all that you can do. So everyone has a place in public health. Computer science has a place in public health. 
Everyone has a place in public health. Now, you've decided to do the MPH program. Everyone here is convinced, and maybe that's why they're sticking around. Now, people like having options, right? So are there certain MPH programs that are better than others? And why would, and what metrics are we using to determine if a program is better than another program? I, I could go ahead with that. So, I mean, when we're talking about certain programs, I also kind of want to consider what are you able to do or what are you, a where are you able to go? Like physically, location wise, is it, are you only kind of able to stay in Ontario, in Toronto? Then maybe you consider schools in Toronto, like the Dalalana School of Public Health. Or maybe you can go to Hamilton, McMaster, or London, Ontario, maybe consider Western. So think about those geographic barriers. Then obviously you want to think of stuff like cost. Is it practical for me to apply to this program that's really expensive? Maybe is there governmental assistance for applying to some of these programs? And then there's other things to think about, like your experience level. Some public health programs actually use experience, maybe they say three years minimum working professionals as a criteria for acceptance, right? And as someone coming from an undergraduate program, you have to kind of assess from within to see if you would be okay to getting into getting accepted into a program with, you know, fully fledged public health professionals that have years and years of experience. Will that make you feel left out? Imposter syndrome. But there's also kind of the other hand of that. It's a rich opportunity to learn from their experiences. But you have to kind of decide for yourself what you're comfortable with based on your experiences. So that's something to consider too. I think to add on to that, something I would recommend is really going into each program and looking at the courses that they offer and like how their program is essentially laid out. Um, because some schools offer certain electives that others don't. And if you are interested in, say, infectious diseases or climate change, and there is a school that doesn't offer a course on that within the master's program, then you may be kind of held back in terms of what you want to expand your knowledge base in. And so I'd really recommend um, really looking at the coursework, seeing if there is a practicum opportunity that's offered. Some schools offer practicums for four months, others offer offer them for eight months. So really think about how you would gear your own um, degree to really like help you advance your career um, and whether the courses that are available, the practicum options that are available um, really meet those needs. I love that. What's your end goal? Think, think deeply about why you're doing this MPH program, why you're applying. Are you just trying to get an MPH for the sake of getting an MPH? What is your end goal? Like, what are you trying to accomplish? Maybe it's a specific job or role you see in the government of Canada, PHAC, Public Health Agency of Canada, that you've been aiming for. And you've done some background research and saw that a lot of people working in that space have an MPH as kind of that core acceptance criteria to get a position. So you have to think about why you're doing it, just like Bindra said, the end goal. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And Bindra also mentioned program length. So for me, I wasn't, uh, I was out of school for four years before going back. So I graduated my bachelor's and then I worked for four years before going back to the master of public health program. And I wasn't uh, thrilled about spending more than a year in school. So I selected a program. The only programs I considered were ones that were 12 months or less. So if, if you want to fast track, uh, potentially at a more of an expense as well, one year programs on a year to year basis tend to be a little bit more expensive in like the year, if you look at just the year itself. So we'll make that consideration. Another consideration is accreditation. So we know in Canada, this is maybe less so relevant, uh, but for folks who maybe want to study in Canada and would maybe consider studying elsewhere, like the States after, I know like the D certain DRPH programs, so the Doctor of Public Health programs, uh, some of them require that you had taken a Master of Public Health program from a a CIF accredited uh, uh, university or, or program. And see what CIF means is Council on Education for Public Health. So that's something to consider if you have intentions of maybe studying in the future, consider if the program is accredited or not. And uh, we actually have a comment about, can international students apply to these programs that we're mentioning in Canada? That's a great question. And I think that's also dependent on the MPH program itself. A lot of times they do accept both domestic, so 
Canadian-based students and international-based students, but with the caveat that tuition rates may be different. And oftentimes, yeah. it's much, much higher. So to answer your question, yes, you probably can apply, but consider two things, the cost of the program and also consider the limited applicant pool that they may reserve for these types of programs. And oftentimes, it could range from one, two, or it can go up to five. But in general, these classes, in, at least in Canada, are made up of uh, domestic-based students. Another thing I also want to add is um, the um, opportunity to do research as well. Like while most of these MPH programs are course-based and considered a professional degree, um, you might have an opportunity for some programs to do a thesis option, or you might want to pursue an MSc in um, public health instead of an MPH degree um, if research is the route that you want to go in terms of your career options. Uh, so also keep that in mind because not all of the MPH programs are only practicum-based. There are definitely thesis options out there um, if that's what you're looking to pursue as well. So, and yeah, exactly, Bindra. And one of the other things I, I see uh, Zara actually has a, uh, a message in this chat here. Um, Zara's wondering, uh, she's basically saying that um, there's a, this individual has a position with the federal government and they're wondering if it would make them a better applicant to an MPH program. So thinking about some of your current experiences and kind of seeing your fit within a, a given program. One of the things I would say about that is it really depends how you frame that experience, right? If you're going to say, I work for the Canadian government and I, you know, I just do a lot of paperwork, it's not specific. Maybe talk about how some of the work, maybe you're creating a document. How does that document affect other things downstream of the work that you're doing? So how does it affect uh, populations in Canada? How does it affect the general public? How does it contribute to public health? So I would make that connection. You could work literally anywhere and make that connection with any position. It's just a matter of you framing it appropriately. Yeah. And just to add on to that real quickly, LaShawn. So the framing also applies to why you want to do it. So if you already have a good job and you're happy where you're at, why do you want to do an MPH? So you'd have to indicate on the application how having an MPH will allow you to further your goals either in that organization or to be able to utilize what you've learned in that organization paired with the public health to make a bigger impact somewhere else. Yeah. And Sarah also asked the questions related to reaching out to some of these programs. Um, is the program had the best person to contact when investigating a program? I would say yes. It's one of the options. The program had the program coordinator, but I also like checking with students that have done the program before. So check on LinkedIn check on social media, maybe uh, public health professionals have graduated from your MPH school of interest. Reaching out to alumni of that school or current students in that program is one of the best sources of information. And make sure, like even if you're listening to us right now, make sure you get multiple perspectives to have a balanced approach to these application processes. So thanks for that question, Sarah. So um, I just want to take a chance here to basically say for those of you who have just recently joined us, I know you aren't probably getting the messages that we put into the chat earlier on. I just wanted to take the second to say that we have multiple podcasts that talk about professional development, how to get jobs, how to target your dream job. So a lot of professional development, public health based podcasts. So if you haven't already, check out our podcast. I, I'm dropping the links for Spotify and Apple. So um Make sure you go ahead and subscribe and check us out if you're liking what we're saying. All right. And leave us a rating as well. Perfect. Thanks, LaShawn. So now that we've kind of talked about a bit of a warm-up, like, is it for me? Uh, what do I need to know before? So you've decided to apply. You've chosen your school. And I saw a question in there about what top schools are the, what schools are the best. Uh, that's case-by-case case basis. So like I said, the best school for me was the one that I could get out of in 12 months. Uh, so that's so it automatically rules out stuff like U of T, who is considered one of the best schools in Canada. And I'm in a pretty good job right now. So I would say in the programs in Canada, as far as I'm aware, beyond the student-specific experiences where a student might say, I didn't like how they did this or did that, all schools that, as far as I'm aware, in Canada are prestigious enough to give you the tools enough 
to go out and be an effective public health professional. Now, we can nitpick between McMaster, U of T, Western, uh, UBC, and all that stuff. But by and large, if you're applying to a Canadian MPH program and you've done your research, that one would be the right one for you, depending on your situation. So what are those, what are some of those administrative specific requirements that you've come across? I know I've applied to two universities for MPH, Western and Brock University. LaShawn, I know you applied to, to two as well. And Bindra, obviously you went through the process. So what, what's sort of the general process for applying to an MPH? Like in terms of what's typically required of all programs? Bindra, do you want to start off with that? Yeah, for sure. So typically the main things that you want to look for um, in terms of minimum requirements are, of course, GPA. They want you to send your transcript. Um, but also in addition to that, you need references, you need a statement of interest, um, which is also referred to as a letter of intent. Um, and then you need your CV or resume sometimes to add in as well. Those are typically the main things that are required for domestic students. In addition, some international students may require you to do an English proficiency test um, or additional requirements on top of that. Um, but those are generally the main aspects for majority of the schools within Canada. Yeah, and um, that's a great point. And Dara actually asked the question along um, this. So it's, is an academic reference required for most MPH programs? And how would you go about getting that um, kind of how, if you've been a working professional, how would you go about getting that if it is a requirement, essentially? Uh, it depends on the program. It's a very program specific question. Usually they like kind of that academic and working professional um, type reference. Usually they ask for two or three. So in my case, I went with the a professional reference, so a working professional reference, and an academic reference. There are kind of caveats to that. The MPH programs know that a lot of times there are seasoned working professionals that come through to these programs and apply to them, and they give them the flexibility to say, hey, you know, they realize you've been working for 10 years, five years, and have been out of touch with a lot of your academic contacts, so it's okay to submit two working-based references instead of um, that academic reference. So that's a program specific question you should definitely reach out to the program coordinator about. But in general, that's what I've noticed. Mm -hmm. And that falls into one of the questions that we also received uh, about how are mature students or mature student applicants assessed. So as I, as I mentioned, I was working for four and a half years before applying to the MPH. One of the things you have to consider, and it might be too late at this point, but if you have an opportunity to maintain connections from your undergrad education, it's always good to have an academic reference. Um, so I stayed in touch with at least one person where it wasn't a surprise when I reached out and said, it wasn't like I haven't talked to them in 20 years uh, type of deal. So if you can, uh, and you're graduating and maybe you're not thinking of applying this year, don't let those academic references go to waste always just stay in contact with maybe a professor who you've worked with, who you really liked, who they you've had good, good interactions with. So just, that's just a, a pro tip right there. Uh, in terms of how a mature students are assessed, uh, it, different parameters than uh, an undergrad, right? So if you just finish undergrad, you might not have had an opportunity to build up as much formidable work experience. Throughout that though, you might have had opportunities to volunteer extracurricular that you can demonstrate some public health knowledge. If you're a mature student, uh, the angle that I took at least was, I'm a little bit frustrated with, so for example, working in a pharmacy, dispensing medications, seeing the same people come back. So my value add was, I've tried to do it sort of the traditional healthcare way, it's not working, and I would like to go a little bit more upstream. So you're not, uh, in some situations, you might have an advantage when a program specifically wants to recruit people with more experience, but I would say the value comes from how you put yourself forward as a candidate for a program, whether you're inexperienced or not. Yeah, exactly. And um, Don is asking the question here about um, what makes you stand out as an applicant, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, before we kind of go on to the next question, I also wanted to point out one important idea of these application processes. Make sure you look into the deadlines of these programs and make sure once you 
understand the different application materials you need, so the academic references, the GPA, transcripts, etc., you give yourself enough time to figure that all out. Sometimes different registrars at universities take long to submit transcripts. Sometimes if you reach out to your academic trans, um, your academic reference or your working reference for a reference, they might get back to you in two months, but maybe you need them to work with you in a one-week timeline. Keep that in mind. And also, when you think about applications, and I just kind of thought about this idea recently after a conversation with one of my global health professionals for um, colleagues at work, just because an application, call for application for MPH program opens in September, for example, you don't have to submit it right away. And there are kind of some cons of submitting it right away if you think about it, if you have like four months to actually submit it. If you submit it right away and then two months go by and then you're like, gosh, I should have added this to my application. I'm doing this work now. That would have strengthened my application. So think about it. Just kind of reminisce over some of your experiences and let those ideas mature. Let those other ideas mature and help that. Help that. Use that maturation process to help strengthen your application process over those few months. And then submit it at the last responsible moment. Not, not a minute before the deadline, maybe a few days, a week. But don't leave it till the very last second because portals fail all the time. And you might need to get some special ex exemption to this deadline. So keep that in mind. Last responsible moment. We also got another question asking how um, you would rank the admission criteria from least to most important. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that every school, every program looks at this differently. Um, so don't let like a minimum criteria that you might not be meeting hold you back from applying because you might really stand out in other areas of the application. Um, so mm -hmm. even if you might have a GPA on the lower end um, or don't have as much work experience, you're just a fresh undergraduate, um, don't think that's going to hold you back. Really focus on your letter of intent and try to um, word yourself or make a narrative in a way that helps you stand out, even if your other um, components of the application might, may not be as strong. Absolutely. So another question as well is along the lines of what we talked about earlier, academic background or your work experience in terms of what field you worked in. So someone wanted to know, are there any sort of beneficial undergrad courses that give you an edge to either maybe gain admissions or maybe let's say give you the knowledge base to fit in once you get in? I think the number one course that's required for most programs, not all, is statistics. Um, it's definitely one of the first introduction courses that you do in your MPH, and I think if you do do that within your undergrad, that will help you out a lot um, in terms of just getting an introduction to the stats background of what an MPH uh, provides. So I'd really recommend taking that in your undergrad. Yeah, and I guess generally speaking, any sort of courses that involve team-based activities, in public health, you're mm -hmm. going to be working in teams all the time and you're going to be collaborating with different stakeholders. So you want to kind of get experience, at least in that academic sense from your courses, that what are kind of what works and what doesn't work when it comes to working in teams, especially for you as an individual. Absolutely. And one question that was there as well, and rightly so, MPH programs can get pricey. So a lot of people wonder or are concerned around the availability of scholarships or funding opportunities. So I know I could say there are perhaps not as many as you would find from doing an undergrad. Uh, you can find bursaries th through graduate associations of the schools that you go to. Uh, you can obviously do quick Google searches like we do. There are other opportunities, maybe some grants out there, but, but by and large, uh, you are expected to, uh, Unless a program, you can get government funding to attend a certain program, in those situations, you're expected to come up with the funds. So the MPH in that way perhaps isn't as accessible as it could be, but there are unfortunately, as far as I'm aware, not many opportunities to make a significant dent through grants or bursaries or anything like that yeah. for your education and in public I've health. I've seen a lot of cases, though, where international students get funding from their native country and then use mm -hmm. that funding to come study abroad. So that's something you should look into because a lot of times, that, like Gordon mentioned, there aren't those supports 
financially for international students. And the international tuition can be significantly higher than domestic tuition. So I, for those of you applying internationally, I feel it for you. But I will say, I have a, Lashan and I have a few friends, I'm sure Bindra as well, who have, uh, who were international students, who have per persevered. Obviously, it's a huge financial toll. And they're, you know, and they're in great jobs right now, super professional. So if you're worried about making the right or wrong choice by coming to Canada or not, just know a lot of what is going to drive your success is going to be you rather than what prof you had, rather than what program you went to, rather than what province you went to, rather than what school you went to. So, uh, you know, money, the money being the factor that you can put aside, if you can put that aside for a second, know that you can drive your success if you're able to secure funding. Mm -hmm. All right. So everyone's concerned with how to stand out. So we've talked about all those factors to consider before an application. Now they're in the process of we've convinced them to do it. And now they're writing all these uh, personal statements and getting their transcripts, getting reference letters. So within that box, how can people stand out in general? What are some pro tips that you have for standing out? One of the things that I would say in general is public health is very multidisciplinary. And as such, applicants come from all over business, economics, you know, whatever the field you may be in, arts, you can find a way and a specific skill set that you bring that you can offer to public health to help influence and, inc you know, allow for the betterment of the population of health. So whether that's you know, business skills, um, you know, if you come from an economic background and you're talking about value for money, when you're talking about interventions in public health, a lot of the times the way different interventions or services are funded is by making a justification for the value of money. Now, if you have a strong background in the financial sense, you can bring that to public health and use that to your advantage, right? And the same goes for different uh, things like arts. If you come from an arts background, I'm assuming you've done a lot of communicating, writing. There's a lot of applicable areas like writing policy briefs that you can bring your skills to, being able to tailor your writing, your presentation skills to specific audiences. That's at the core of public health to make sure no one's left behind. So that's kind of that one point to make you stand out. Use your skills that you already have, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in the health space. And there's a lot of chat in the comment section here about mm -hmm. volunteering, experiences. Again, you don't necessarily, there's no one answer to those questions. Like where, if I volunteer for XYZ organization, will that help me get in? It might. It depends on what you're doing at that work and how you kind of connect it to your narrative and story that you submit to these MPH programs. Now, you might be in the situation where Maybe you're thinking, hey, I don't have public health experience. What do I do? Right. And I didn't think I had public health experience either applying out of my biochemistry um, bachelor's degree. And it might be true, but I was able to link the different initiatives and job experiences that I had. I worked in the biopharmaceutical company. What possibly can that have to do with public health? Well, the vaccine processes that I used and purified um, were shipped somewhere. Those vaccines were shipped somewhere to help the to help the global effort to eliminate certain diseases, right? So make that connection to public health, even though it might not seem like it. And if you're kind of figuring out different ways to learn more about public health before you submit an application, there are so many different online free courses that you can check out um, on Coursera, on edX. I literally, before I took my public health uh, degree, my MPH, I went on Coursera and edX and I probably took 10 different courses before I even got into public health about epidemiology, public basics of public health, biostatistics. And I realized that might be on the extreme end of things. You don't obviously have to do that, but I was really curious, what am I getting into? What am I dedicating one or two years of my life to? So you want to kind of get that background and a good sense of what it's about and it'll help you tailor your application. So yeah, that's that's how I would say to stand out. There's different ways, with or without experience. Oh, someone was asking, 
Coursera. Okay, someone. Yeah, put I'll, it in I'll, chat. I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll drop the link for yeah. Zara said it. Okay, perfect. So one of the other questions related to that is: Does a lab experience help with your application? Lashan and essentially answered that. If you can link what you're doing at a cellular level to the implications at the public health level, whether it's this particular identifying this particular protein uh, and gene will help people who suffer from muscular dystrophy and there's hundreds of thousands of people that suffer from this and it's going to alleviate the burden on the healthcare system, caregivers. And like, that's how you, you have to make a case for what it's not so much about. There's a silver bullet to find that gives you, uh, gives you an in into public health. Mm -hmm. It's your framing of your experience. There's people asking about, Oh, I went, I did an international undergrad and how do I link that on my un overseas experience? Well, that's up to you. So depending on where you went to school, the culture and the, the, the country and everything's very different. Maybe the burden of disease is different. You can make a case for the observations that you've seen and why you want to, why it was important for you to pursue public health to maybe address those. So it's all about framing your, the why and the what, which we'll get to shortly. Anything you want to throw in there, Binja? Oh, mute. Yeah, mute, Binja. Sorry, I was going to say some questions that we got were asking, like, what activity should I even pursue to help me stand out? I think you should just pursue what you're really, really interested in and what excites you because that's going to, that's what's going to help you stand out on your application. And if you pursue something that's within your realm of interest, it doesn't have to be necessarily, you know, exactly what public health professionals do, um, but it could be something as small as like working for a vaccine company, something that is, you know, within your own interest. When you write about it on your application, you're going to be, you're going to be able to stand out way more passionate about that. And that will really shine through to the admissions committee. Um, and also try to think about it more about its implications at a broader level, not just like your day-to-day -day responsibilities of like, you know, working as a research assistant, but more so broadly, what does this um, help in terms of the population health in general, in terms of public health in general, and like really think about how your experience, what your experiences taught you about public health and write that down within your application. Awesome. And we're going to move into the, uh, the writing personal statements now, because there's a lot of questions on it. But one more thing to mention. So would some, it's not only about aligning your experience to public health. Like as of this moment, I'm going to seek public health opportunities is reflecting on op, uh, experiences that you've already had. So for example, I worked with a brain injury association. Uh, I think I was in maybe second or third year of undergrad. No idea what public health was. I didn't do it because I was interested in public health. I just did it. When you learn more about public health, you start reflecting, oh, wow, what I was doing was really knowledge translation. Knowledge translation is a core part of public health, making uh, public health information more accessible for people, right? Why was that important? Uh, caregivers and the people who experience their brain injury are affected, and then you're able to build organizational capacity. So it's not so much about going and finding stuff. It's how do I reframe my present and previous experience? Make sense? All right. So, so before that, da, da, da. Gordon, one more oh. question before we go on. So I think this yes. question was mentioned a couple of times here, the differences between the MSc and MPH. Mm. So just in general, there are, there are kind of a lot of categories here, but in terms of the MPH, you could do a course-based MPH or a thesis-based MPH, which I'll let Binder talk about in a second. The, MP, the MSc, on the other hand, oftentimes has a thesis component to it or can also be course-based. So an example that I saw brought up here was the MSc in Global Health at McMaster University. That is a course-based master's and it also has the option for a thesis-based option. Usually when people pursue a thesis-based option, they are more interested in that research component of public health or global health and they maybe want to pursue a PhD in that area. So that's something to think about. If, you're, if you know you're going to go into academia, specifically research, maybe you want to look more into thesis-based um, masters. Whereas if you're, if you're kind of steering towards more non-research, um, public health practice type work, like program evaluation, um, economic analysis, stuff like that, maybe an MPH is more suited to you for you. But keep in mind, even though... I did a general MPH, I'm very well into research and I'm doing a lot of research and I'm publishing papers. So that doesn't 
exclude you from doing that research stuff. The general MPH gives you the skills to learn about research methodologies, methodologies, etc. But the thesis goes a step further and takes you through that whole academic process of doing that. So yeah, sorry, go ahead, Gordon. Oh, I thought Bindra was going to chime in. Oh yeah, MSC. yeah. Unless we're MSC. good. I can, I can yeah. add in a bit to yeah. that. So um, even yeah. if you don't know that you want to do research and you might not you know, want to pick that option right away, there are certain programs that allow you to pick once you get it. And so, for example, the program I did was the MPH at McMaster. And going in for first semester, you don't need to choose whether you want to do the thesis route or the course-based route, you actually decide in your second semester after, you know, taking a few courses and realizing where your interests lie. Um, so really keep that in mind that certain programs don't make you choose right away if you want to do research, but more so gain that experience, figure out where your interests lie, and then make the decision after. Yeah. And just to kind of wrap that specific part up, and this kind of leads us nicely into the next section, um, it's about statement of interest. Do we include whether we want a course-based or thesis-based option in our statement of interest? The answer is it depends on what the program wants of you. Usually they say specify if you want thesis or course-based. Sometimes they don't. Uh, so, yeah. Absolutely. So this all sounds great. You're saying what to include and what not to include. But where where is a gold mine? Like what should people be focusing on to stand out on their personal statement. Because as far as we know, I know uh, there's some uh, program managers that will snoop around social media and stuff to see what you've been up to, but all they can really go off is what you submit on paper and on the internet portal. So it's up to us to find a way to authentically present our best foot forward in the space of public health. So what do we include to make this happen? But Sean, what do we put on there? It's a personal statement, right? It's a statement of interest. And I think to some degree that should involve some sort of personal narrative of what led you to wanting to do public health. And I like the word you use there, Gordon, be authentic. You don't want to make up a story just to kind of appeal to what they want to hear. You want to make it your own and craft your own way towards public health. So draw from your work experiences your volunteer experiences, and it could even be personal experience like family interactions, etc. Those are all amazing things to talk about when we're talking about what to include for your statement of interest. Now, where you can go wrong is talking about very generic things. And another thing, you can do a lot of over-explaining that you don't really have to do. So if you are in the statement saying, I know public health, this is what public health is, I know that this is public health. You're giving the impression that you know everything about public health. And it's even worse if you don't actually know what public health is and they're reading into it and saying, this is not what public health is. This is actually medicine. So, so yeah. Right, right. I was going to say, LaShawn, the healthcare one is a big pet peeve of, of uh, program admissions. Yeah. Yeah. So, ma so yeah. make sure, like, you don't over explain. And if you're going to say something, make sure that it is factually correct. So, yeah. um, and and the, another question that also came up in line with standing out is there's questions around, you know, if I wanted to just use MPH as a stepping stone to get into medicine or dentistry or pharmacy, how do I frame that? And my answer to that is, and I'd love to hear everyone else's answer is just be authentic. Implement and incorporate the different aspects of these experiences that I mentioned and kind of have a plan and vision of why, what you're going to do with your MPH. They want to know why you're doing it. So answer that question. Why? Don't s skip around and not answer it. They want to know why and how you, with your unique ability and your interests, can help, you know, improve the health, the population's health. So that's all great, LaShawn. And I don't think we're, we're getting, cl I guess we're getting closer to figuring out what that looks like. Mm. So I guess the elephant in the room is sort of how do you create a narrative for your personal statement? And I'll take this because I'm, I'm a writer. So I'll, I'll kind of, I'll even give you some potential ways you can open it. Right? So the first thing is you have to reflect on what you've done, reflect on where you are now and reflect on where you want to go. That's the first thing. So before you even start writing the statement, maybe jot down, maybe you're, 
riding the bus, you're watching something and something comes to your head, just write it down. So one of the other elephants in the room is sort of COVID-19. So a lot of folks who are interested in public health now Mm -hmm. were inspired to maybe join or made aware of the field of public health through the happenings of COVID-19 and have decided to pursue public health. Now imagine as a program admissions officer reading 500 applications that all say COVID, 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 right? So now that's not a license to not talk about COVID if that's in fact the truth, but you have to be careful around your framing. So for example, COVID-19 opened my eyes around the importance of health communication, right? Health communication is not taught in many public health programs. And this particular program offers me a chance to X, Y, Z. So you have to state what you're wishing to contribute to the field of public health and how that program you're applying to can help you meet that goal. And it goes back to what LaShawn said. If you're writing about public health as a final product, like you already know what it is, then what do they have to offer you? So that's another thing you have to be mindful in your writing. You need to write in the active voice. So the active voice is something like, I I was inspired to pursue an MPH because of, of COVID-19, but not for the reasons you might think. My parents suffered from this and this, and they weren't able to access the hospital because elective surgeries were canceled, whatever. Then I realized that, there's a disconnect between public health and the healthcare system, blah, 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 blah. That's kind of how, just talk us through how you arrived at, yes, I want to do public health. So that's something, opening your personal statement with something very impactful rather than my experience has made me the best can't, no, don't do that. So open with a story, your personal narrative. Yeah, Inja, I totally agree. What do you think? Um, yeah. Gordon, I think the most important thing to remember is it's, always quality over quantity. Um, Don't Mm. try to list all the experiences that you've had um, just to be like, look, here are all the great things I've done in public health. They have your CV for that. They don't want to see that. Even if you have one or two experiences that really, you know, help you forget your passion and your decision to pursue public health, talk about that. Make it a story. Make them really get to know who you are as a person and what you want to do with the degree. I think it's really important to not just talk about and reflect on these experiences that you've had, but also where you'll go with it. Um, really frame it into a story. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is also look um, look into the school that you're applying to. Don't try to give the same exact personal statement for every single school that you're applying to. One thing I did was every personal statement I submitted, I had a section, a very little section of the uh, it included in the statement about why that program specifically will help me pursue my career goals. Um, I think that's really important because the schools want to know why them specifically. And if you can make a case for why you want to go there, what are the benefits and advantages of their program versus others, I think that will really give you an edge um, and help you stand out as a competitive applicant, not just through your own experiences, but how their program will help you ultimately accomplish your own career goals. Mm-hmm. And real quickly before you, you, you jump in, LaShawn, so someone was asking too along those lines, if you have several formative experiences, how do you go about explaining that in, that in your application? So like Bindra said, don't try to do too much. I think somewhere early on you could say, throughout my life, I've had several experiences that have led me here. However, I would like to elaborate on this particular one and just be very strong with it. And the reason I want to elaborate on this is because there was this level of uniqueness with this particular experience. And that's, so use it to tell a story. Don't, it's similar to a cover letter. Don't talk about every single job you've done. That's why a resume is there. Just hone in on one specific experience that you want to narrate yourself through. Yeah. And uh, one, one small thing that's often overlooked is the grammar and spelling mistakes. Oh. And yeah. I'll tell you a quick story because I got lucky, I guess, but... For my MPH application, I actually made such a huge error, but thankfully, I still got accepted. Luckily, I put the wrong program name. Like, so you got to be careful. <laughs> Double check everything, right? So you don't want to be submitting that because that should have been a red flag. Like, I wouldn't have accepted myself if I had seen that. 
right? Mm -hmm. So learn from my mistake and triple check, especially that program part. I love to apply to blank school. Make sure you get the right one, especially right. if you're doing multiple so, well, applications, right? That's right. when you get kind of confused and maybe you use specific areas of your application for other applications. That's where you got to yeah. be careful. So what that what that shows, LaShawn, is perhaps you were genuine for the rest of it. And naturally, as a program admissions person, you know folks are applying to several different programs. But if you were disingenuous throughout the whole thing, perhaps it would have been thrown in the trash. Yeah, and, yeah, so, and I think that's a thing. It's like it's okay to use a similar type of application for multiple programs. Obviously, tailor it. Your story is not going to change for each of them just for the sake that it's a different application. But yeah, just be mindful of that, I would say. Mm -hmm. Don't pull a LaShawn. <laughs> Don't pull a LaShawn. Okay. So, yeah, there's a lot of questions here, and we're coming towards the end. So we might – we apologize if we're not able to get to all of them. But we can – of course, you can – you have our LinkedIn uh, accounts there that you can connect with us on a one-on-one -on -one for further elaboration. But we'll, uh, we'll continue to tread on here. So someone also asked um, about – Getting so, can I mention in my application that I have a Master of Science in Public Health in my country of origin? How is this evaluated by the application board? So that's a tough question. I like based on the little information that I know, I would I wouldn't necessarily encourage a person to do another MPH if it's identical to what they already have. What are your thoughts on that? I th I, I it's it's tough, right? Um... It depends on your situation. I have had people that I've worked with that, you know, has done an MPH in their country of origin and has come to Canada, you know, you know, thinking that being educated here under this Canadian system and getting another MPH would be helpful for their specific reason. But, mm -hmm. you know, you just have to assess your own individual situation. Ask people that have right. kind of gone through this a similar situation to kind of get a sense of, is this worth it at the end of the day? Right. Is it worth it? And what are some of these tangible outcomes of doing it or the opportunity cost that you can do instead? You know, so think about that as well. Right. And in terms of doing other stuff instead, there are other certifications that you can pursue uh, outside of the academic setting that can enhance your candidacy for profession the professional world. So I would say maybe consider those routes uh, before pursuing another, it's just really sad if you have to do it. So I'm a little torn about that question. So whoever you are, I hopefully everything works out. So any other questions in the chat that we can uh, uh, throw in I there? I think there's a question about MPH deadlines. Yeah, that's very program specific. Um, someone answered that in April is when I've read most programs. I'll get back to you. March, April. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So another question that has come up, uh, are you familiar with any programs that require you to do an interview before you get admitted or, or as part of the admissions process? Uh, do either of you know? So personally, I haven't heard of any, but I know that many programs reserve the right to interview students in the event that they have further questions. So uh, that's just kind of one caveat. They may or may not, but most of the times I haven't heard really students getting interviewed ahead of this this process so not like an interview to demonstrate your skills but more like a like a phone screening kind of situation yeah, alexandra they, oh sorry, sorry sorry go ahead Vindra. i was gonna say i don't think it's a requirement to apply i think if they yeah. see your application and they decide that maybe we need to you know get more information yeah. on this candidate if they if they want mm -hmm. additional information i think yeah. they might you know have the right to request one i don't think it's required for as far as I know, for most schools in Canada. Yeah, and Alexander, your question, Western said they sometimes do interviews. Yeah, they reserve the right to do it. Gordon and I went through the process and we didn't get interviewed. So it really depends on the situation. Maybe there's something specifically they want to talk about. They just kind of want to reserve that right to do so in the event anything happens. Mm -hmm. Someone also asked about pursuing an MPH after already having a master's in wildlife biology. And I think the same sort of applies with my comment around doing another MPH after you already have another MPH. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of transferable knowledge and skills we know about the field of One Health. Uh, so I would imagine that you should be able to break into public health or One Health. And if you need to maybe 
enhance your skills in leadership uh, and, you know, pro project management. There are certifications out there that you can do to help bridge a gap between the different fields. There's a question in the chat asking what kind of things should our references write about us? I mean, I think when you're asking mm. your references to give you a reference in the first place, really tell them why you're passionate about public health, why you want to go into the field and kind of give them your own story as well. So they're able to kind of tailor their reference to, to what you might want to do within your own application. Um, another thing is to really tell them to focus on the soft skills, something that's really important, which may not, you know, be um, demonstrated through your own personal statement. But if someone else writes about you, is, has been able to see how you are within a classroom setting, within a workplace setting, I think that will really help you stand out. Um, in addition to just, you know, hard, tangible things like GPA and stuff, talking about your soft skills will really help. And it, it depends on your kind of relationship with that potential reference, right? Sometimes they ask you to send their, your statement of interest over, so they kind of have an idea of what you're expecting. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's a work with them type of process to know what some of the requirements they need to successfully write. Sometimes they ask for a CV, cover letter. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it really depends. And, you know, when I reach out to potential academic references or professional references, I always say in that email I'm requesting, I'm obviously – requesting that they do this for this specific program, but I'm also wondering, hey, would you be able to write a solid reference that can speak on point X, Y, Z, right? So it shouldn't be an awkward conversation. I think it's a conversation that should be had though, just so that everyone's expectations are, are there. Are Absolutely. MPH programs very competitive? How are the class sizes for most programs in your experience? So at Western MPH, um, they, they say it's really competitive. Uh, the class sizes is around 60 for our case. Bindra, what was your class I'm size? I was 25, actually, so it was a lot smaller. Okay. Yeah, so it, it really depends. So I would say maybe that 25 to 60 range is pretty good. The Dalalana School of Public Health at UFT is probably a bit bigger because they have multiple different sub-programs and specializations, I would imagine. So... Mm -hmm. From what I've yeah. heard, I think the yeah. acceptance rate is around 5 to 10% for most programs within Canada. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, oh, I was about to say something. Were you about to wrap up? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna. There's a. There's two kind of questions that kind of tie into the wrap up. But yeah, no, I was just saying like y'all are doing a great job. Um, you know, coming to the session, learning more, talking to each other, connecting with each other on LinkedIn, connecting with us on um, all our social medias. We we think that's a great first step. Feel you know, take use of the different resources around you and. You know, Gordon said this in one of the podcast recordings. If you don't get accepted during this cycle, that doesn't mean you're not cut out for public health. We need you in public mm -hmm. health. It's just that next time you kind of retool, ask questions, maybe why you didn't get accepted, ask for feedback. It's always good. It could be harsh sometimes, but we need that. And then you apply again. There's no shame in that. And it's, it's great to apply to multiple programs. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Apply to a broad range of programs, right? So I just want to say... Y'all are doing a great job and continue that great work. And we all need, we need you in public health and global health. So um, we're looking forward to working with you all. Right. I couldn't have said it much better myself. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you, LaShawn, for the, the, giveaway? the giveaway. All right. All right. So given that we're talking about MPH programs, given that we're talking about applications, and given kind of our the resources available at PHI, we wanted to just do a little giveaway that – you know, would kind of help one or one of you with this process in more depth. And of course, we have office hours where we meet with individuals one on one, which you could access through our website. So check that out in the contact section. But for this giveaway, we're offering a, a application review, and all you have to do is one of these things, and that is follow us on Twitter. So follow us on Twitter, or follow us on LinkedIn. Okay or to increase your chances, follow us on both. And we understand that a lot of you have been following us for a long time, which we greatly appreciate. But if you want a chance at winning this giveaway, feel free to send us an email about your thoughts on this specific session. So you could email us at thepublichealthinsight at gmail.com and just give us some feedback about how you thought the session went, what you learned, and yeah, some comments, and then you will be entered and we'll randomly select a name once we compile all these names. And the deadline for this is midnight today. So follow us or send us that email before 
midnight today, and um, you will be entered to win. And of course, you could find us on all social medias by typing in Public Health Insight, and you'll be able to find us for those social media. So Twitter, Instagram, or send us an email if you already are following us. Can you write the mail here? And when, when yes. we will be, when we will be them contacting them, LaShawn? We will be contacting them by tomorrow to see if they okay. have won. Oh. All right. So you heard it here. Do all of what LaShawn just mentioned, and we will uh, meet with you to support you in your MPH yeah. application to the best of our ability. And yes, I will also send the links to the social medias and our email as well. So I just sent out the Twitter, I sent out the Instagram, and I sent out our mail. So go ahead, go nuts, and we look forward to kind of connecting with you there. Gordon, sorry, you were saying. Nope, that's it. So you're done? Yeah, we're good. Oh, okay, we're good. All right, everyone. So you, this was uh, the live Q&A brought to you by Public Health Insight. Thank you for joining. And uh, regardless, we, we're happy if you subscribe to our accounts or social media or podcasts. And don't be a stranger. Stay in the community. Stay in the community. Peace. Peace.